Diabetes insipidus is a rare condition that develops due to the inaction of the hormone ADH. Let us remember where ADH comes from and how it works. Normally, low blood volume and high serum osmolarity stimulates the hypothalamus to produce ADH, which goes to the posterior pituitary gland and is then released into the bloodstream. ADH reaches the nephrons of the kidney via the bloodstream. Here, it acts on a specific part of the nephron known as the collecting duct. In the collecting duct are aquaporin-2 channels which reabsorb water. ADH stimulates production of more aquaporin-2 channels, causing more water reabsorption. In diabetes insipidus, there is decreased action of ADH, causing decrease in aquaporin-2 channels in the collecting tubule and decreased water reabsorption. Diabetes insipidus can either be cranial, in which there is decreased ADH production from the hypothalamus, or nephrogenic, in which there is decreased response to the ADH by kidneys. Let's look at the causes of each of these. Nephrogenic diabetes insipidus can occur due to medications such as lithium or demeclocycline, or it can occur due to mutations of V2 receptors or aquaporin-2 receptors located in the collecting duct. Chronic kidney diseases can also alter the response of kidneys to ADH, and electrolyte imbalances, particularly hypokalemia and hypercalcemia, can also be causes of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Cranial diabetes insipidus can be idiopathic, so we don't really know, or genetic due to AVP gene mutations or Wolfram syndrome. Brain tumors, CNS infections, trauma, and chest infections are also causes of cranial diabetes insipidus. The signs and symptoms of diabetes insipidus are quite straightforward as they include polyuria with patients passing as much as 20 liters of urine each day and polydipsia. Patients may also show symptoms of postural hypotension and dehydration. Here I also want you to know about an important differential of diabetes insipidus which is primary polydipsia. This condition occurs because the patient drinks a lot of water only because he's just always thirsty or due to excessive IV fluids. To diagnose diabetes insipidus, we can measure sodium levels in the serum, which would be higher than normal in this case. This isn't too hard for us to understand because we know from our last video that normally the increased reabsorption of water by ADH promotes the release of atrial natriuretic peptide and B-type natriuretic peptide, which inhibit the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and promote natriuresis. This is why in a world without ADH, there is sodium retention and hence high sodium. So back to diagnosis, we can also measure serum ADH levels. We can also measure osmolality of both urine and plasma. The plasma osmolality should show up higher than urine owing to the high sodium. And so the urine to plasma ratio of osmolality should be less than one. The most important test for diabetes insipidus is the water deprivation test. Here's how it's done. You ask the patient not to have any food or drinks for 8 hours. And at the end of 8 hours, you check urine osmolarity. In both cranial and nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, due to sodium retention, urine osmolarity would be low. In the case of our main differential primary polydipsia, where nothing's wrong with ADH, the urine osmolarity would be high. Because ADH is doing its job by concentrating the urine by reabsorbing water from it. So we can use this test to rule out primary polydipsia here. Right after taking the sample for urine osmolarity test, we also inject desmopressin, an ADH analog. After a further 8 hours, we perform another urine osmolarity test. This time around, the body did have enough ADH thanks to the desmopressin we injected. So in cranial diabetes insipidus, the urine osmolarity would become high. In nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, the urine osmolarity would still be low.
because the problem here isn't a lack of ADH, but the, the kidneys just won't respond to the ADH. So giving more ADH isn't going to make a difference. Finally, how do we treat diabetes insipidus? It's important to note that unfortunately there is no cure, but treatments can greatly reduce symptoms. First, as always, treat the underlying cause. For mild diseases, conservative treatment is advised, such as lifestyle modifications. Desmopressin, the ADH analog, can be used for the treatment of cranial diabetes insipidus. Thiazide diuretics can also be used to control the symptoms of polyuria. Now, before we finish this lecture, I want to bring your attention to yet another type of this disease, gestational diabetes insipidus. To know how pregnancy causes diabetes insipidus, we should know that ADH is metabolized in the liver and the kidneys. And pregnancy causes increased metabolism of ADH by the liver, resulting in decreased ADH and hence diabetes insipidus. With that, we wrap up all you need to know about diabetes insipidus. So remember, study smart, not more. So that was all for today. Remember, we upload full lectures every week. But for more content, you can visit our website, scalia.com. We have exciting new lectures waiting for you. So go visit and happy learning.